Welcome in, we'll get started in just a few moments. So make yourself comfortable. We will begin in just a moment. We'll let everybody get in and get their audio turned on. Welcome in. I have 215. I'm sure we're going to have a few more people come on in and get their audio in. So I will um, go through some housekeeping notes as some more people are getting their audio um, connected. So thanks for being with us, everyone. My name is Crystal Dalmaso. I'm with DECA and I will be your moderator today. So if you have any technical difficulties, please just um, let me know in the chat and I will get you attended to. Today you are in the session, Real-Time Data and Immediate Response in Substance Use Trends. So I hope you're in um, for some really good information today. This session is being recorded and will be available um, on the conference platform one hour after the session ends. We do ask that you keep yourself muted um, unless our presenters ask for you to unmute. Otherwise, please keep um, your microphones muted. Make sure that you um, join today after this session as well, because there'll be a grand prize drawing. Each um, attendance session, um, will, there'll be a drawing for. The conference is also offering free continuing education credits. And so for more information about that, make sure you visit the continuing education page on the platform. Also, you can use the chat feature on the platform. Um, the conference platform, or you can use the chat feature here on Zoom. Um, our, we've got presenters today that will answer your questions from the chat, and we'll be watching that as well. So today we have two fantastic presenters. Um, I'm going to be introducing Seth Dewey. Seth has been actively involved in the recovery community in the area, especially in the recovery housing area since 2017. And in 2019 was elected to the Oxford House World Council, Council, where he currently serves as the vice chairman. In January of 2020, he was brought on to the Reno County Health Department in the role of the substance misuse, misuse health educator, where he serves as the project coordinator for substance misuse grants from the state and federal government. Seth is also a founding member of the Kansas Recovery Network. In October of this year, he re uh, they received their 501c3 status um, confirmation from the IRS. Seth is currently pursuing his Bachelor of Science in organi organization Organizational Leadership through Fort Hayes State University, where he also serves as a student senator and serves on the Equity and Inclusion Committee. We're also going to hear from DJ Gearing, and DJ is the public health analysis for Reno County Health Department, where he works to collect and utilize data for the strategic planning and decision making. Before joining Reno County Health Department, he was the STI and HIV surveillance coordinator for the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. He is a graduate of Wichita State University with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and a graduate of Arizona State University with a Master of Arts in Global Security. So I will stop speaking and I will let these two bring us great information today. So sit back, um, enjoy, and make sure you put your questions in the chat. All right, thank you for that introduction. So let me just share my screen and we'll get started. So Seth and I wanna talk about using real-time data for responding to the opioid crisis. Um, and on the right here, we have a picture of a program called ODMAP uh, taken near late September. And uh, the one thing I want you to take away so far from this picture is the big gap in users uh, in this Western part in the central part of the United States through Texas, Missouri, and Nebraska, Iowa. Because um, as you will learn, it is important that not only counties in Kansas get involved, but our neighboring states get involved as well. So the main program that we use to track real-time data for suspected overdose is a program called ODMAP, which is entirely free. There's no payment. It's an easy system to use. 
uh, health departments, hospitals, EMS, fire departments, law enforcement agencies are all qualified to get involved in ODMAP to input data or at least monitor the data that is inputted into ODMAP. And what this does, it helps us collaborate, it helps us assist in responding. It helps us track overdose trends, the types of drugs involved, the number of fatalities, the number of Narcan used at the suspected overdose events as well. And I'll let Seth go through the, through the timeline of how we got started. Awesome. Thank you, DJ. So um, give you a little bit of a backstory. So it's not just like coming out of the out of left field, you know, um, Reno County has has always had great community uh, partnerships. And there was a, a little group that they had uh, a collaborative, if, if you will, that's been dealing with substance uh, use issues in the community for a long time, a, a well founded uh, multi sector uh, coalition, right. So DJ, you were uh, brought on to the health department what, in November of 19, right? And uh, then I was brought on in January. <laughs> and during this time, we had our leadership at the Reno County Health Department that were holding these initial conversations um, about this program called OD Map. But it wasn't officially all about OD Map at the beginning. What we were hearing, as DJ and I were talking about before, we were hearing that uh, from the community that we had more overdoses than were being reported. And with our leadership in the health department talking about figuring out a solution for this, um, that's when we began having uh, conversations about ODMAP and educating ourselves uh, on this particular program. And if we were to start using this program, what would that look like? How would we use this uh, information? And we'll be honest, DJ and I'll both be honest with you that at first we didn't know exactly how we were going to use it, but we knew that this would give us a direction at least. Um, then in August of uh, 2020, uh, one of our partners on that uh, community coalition, uh, the Reno County EMS, uh, they sat down with us and they had some interesting conversations and we were able to take down their uh, questions and concerns about ODMAP, including the biggest one that's always going to come up is HIPAA concerns. And if you'll notice in the file section of uh, the program on here, that document is available for download if you have any uh, privacy concerns for OD map. I would encourage you and your organizations to look into it if you're curious about that. Um, because once we were able to sit down with EMS and look at that document and have their, uh, their privacy director look over that, a lot of things started falling into place. And then by October of 2020, October 1 of 2020, that's when our EMS were officially onboarded uh, into that. And at first, um, you know, we were trying to figure it out. Uh, it was a learning curve. And then in December of 2020, that's when we had our first spike alert. And in this particular spike alert, go ahead and if you want to expand on that, DJ, this particular spike alert was due to an increase in heroin overdoses. And of course, DJ being the amazing uh, data and information uh, guru that he is, he's able to put that of course into a heat map. So we're able to see those high intensity areas that are experiencing those higher levels of, of overdose in that particular time. So at the same time that this was going on, we also had our first conversations with uh, the Reno County Medical Examiner or the coroner's office. It was a, it was a, almost like a, it was almost like everything was meant to be uh, because there was a new change in leadership uh, within that office. And as soon as he uh, heard about this, he jumped all over it. He wanted to be a part of it. As soon as that happened, we started getting another clear picture. Some, some gaps were starting to get filled in. And in January, just uh, he, he, he was onboarded like that. 
And that's when we started to, like I say, fill in some of the gaps. And in March, we saw our uh, second uh, spike alert. And this one was due to an increase in oxycodone uh, overdoses. So we'll get into what exactly constitute the spike alert framework here in a little bit. But right now, we just want to let you guys see how this is working and, and, and the timeline, so to speak. So then in June, we saw our third spike alert. And this is where we started to particularly see a difference in the trends. Uh, if you want to click on that one, DJ, go ahead too, because this is where uh, we started seeing our, our methamphetamine uh, increase. Now, this is something we've been hearing about for, for years, really, uh, psychostimulant stimulant use going up and more of an overdose uh, issue with these substances. But this was really the first time we'd seen it in the amounts that it was happening. And then in October of uh, uh, the, just this last month, we saw our fourth spike alert due to an increase in methamphetamine overdoses once again. So you might be asking, well, you keep saying spike alert. Well, what's that look like? Well, what that looks like for us when we're talking about spike alert alerts is you're able to uh, set your own standard, so to speak, of what a spike alert is going to look like. Now, typically, it's, I believe it's the standard on there that it's when three overdoses occur within a 24-hour period. Now, you can make those adjustments. So um, you can not only set those adjustments and those parameters for your county, but also surrounding counties. We might think, well, why would we need to do that? Well, we'll get into that a little bit later, too. And these uh, spike alert thresholds are... Um, at, at your uh, agency's determination and discretion to make those adjustments too. And the reason that that's important is because it gives us that freedom to determine over the course of time what our baseline is, if three is too many, if three is not enough. And so that's where it's just important for us to at least start collecting this data and looking at the suspected overdoses in a real time as they happen uh, availability. And so now uh, we're gonna get a little bit more into the data piece. And for that, of course, I'm gonna turn that back over to DJ. Right, and just to add on to the spike alerts too, the, the biggest benefit on top of being able to set a spike alert for your own county is the fact that you can set spike alerts for other counties and other states as well. So, if another county in Kansas gets onboarded, like Sedgwick County for us uh, being close neighbors, we can set a spike alert for Sedgwick County. And if something, if something occurs there, we're at least given a notification and an advance warning that something could be coming through into Reno County the very next day, possibly same day. Uh, you, with other states, we constantly look at the state of Oklahoma. Uh, Oklahoma is only reporting fatalities, so they're not reporting everyday overdoses. But without fail, every time we see an increase in drug fatalities, particularly in the Tulsa area, within that week, Reno County gets a spike alert for that same substance almost every single time. And so this is where it's really important that even if right now you don't have a lot of partners going in, you can still see and get value out of what everyone else is putting into it currently. And for us, our goal is to get more Kansas counties on board because we can practically see the, the substance trail as it's moving its way up from Tulsa into the Kansas border, and then it disappears. We don't know which direction it went because there's only two counties in Kansas that are currently entering in the suspected overdose information, one being us in Reno County, the other one being the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department of Wyandotte County. Um, on top of that, on top of the OD map spike alert, we like to verify through essence. And not every health department is going to have a syndromic surveillance program that is easily usable. For us, we weren't able to use the essence program, which is provided through, I believe, John Hopkins and CDC as a collaboration. We weren't able to get into that until March of 2020. 
If your hospital uses a system called Cerner, they're automatically connected to Essence. There's no need uh, for trying to get connected, but uh, there are still a lot of hospital systems in Kansas that aren't reporting into Essence because their systems don't talk to each other. So if you're from a health department on this call, you may not have access to the same data. Uh, we do, and so we like to use it to verify. Uh, we can also use it in other ways too, because what syndromic surveillance is, is hospital ED visits. So when we pull up the data, we can see whether that ED visit was brought in by EMS or not. And for those that were not brought in by EMS, we can, we can add it to our suspected overdose number from OD map and get a more accurate picture, which is this top line here. So this is OD map plus the essence numbers that do not mention EMS bringing them in. So these are primarily walk-ins. Uh, the other thing that we're able to monitor through ED visits is how many of those overdoses also come with a mental health issue. So that could be whether the overdose was due to a suicide attempt or whether the overdose also just occurred in someone who has bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. And what we found through this collaboration is that about 49 and a half percent, so nearly half of all suspected overdose ED visits have some type of mental health issue when they go in. So that's one, that's another way that we're able to look at some of these co-occurring issues between mental health and substance use. And the system is also in real time or near real time. It updates every day. You can check it as soon as you come in with the morning when you check your OD map data and get a clear picture or a clearer picture of what's happening in the community. Seth, do you wanna talk about the response framework and press releases? Yes, of course. Awesome, so um, the response framework, and I think it's interesting to note, um, and, and the reason we wanted to talk about this so much is because, for instance, we've, we enjoy our, our, our partnerships and our multi-sector multi partnerships that we uh, all are seeing a good example of today here at this conference. Um, but programs like OD Map um, in, in rural America can present a challenge, but that doesn't negate the fact that they can be very useful, right? And I think that's why it's important that we get out here and we talk about the, the strengths, we talk about how the fact of the matter is, we're learning, we're figuring this out. And part of this is that response framework. So we talked about the spike alerts. So, how this all works is when a spike alert's received, um, myself uh, and DJ are uh, alerted to it. We discuss it with our um, supervisor and our leadership here at the health department. And what we do then is we go through and we look at the overdoses. Now, if it's three overdoses within a 24 hour period, for instance, if it's one methamphetamine, uh, one heroin and one prescription pills, in that case, we would not issue a, a, a press release or a con, continue to uh, uh, act on that spike alert. Now, if there are three overdoses within 24 hour period and it ends up all being heroin or all being methamphetamine, what that tells us is there's something different, right? Now, we don't know the exact reason for it, but we know something is obviously different about this. So this is where we uh, get together. We look at these, uh, the data that we've received. Uh, we analyze that. And DJ, of course, helps break those things down into a little bit more of a, a specific uh, uh, manner. So if the spike meets the criteria, that's when we pass that information along to our communications director and our director at the health department. Now our communications director already has a format that she uses for communicating this type of a message to the public. Um, one that we, um, as it brings out too in uh, pair, or bullet point number four there, the stakeholders are informed. That's that collaborative we were talking about. This collaborative, let me tell you who makes this collaborative up real quick. So not only do we have uh, health department involvement, we have our uh, law enforcement, we have EMS, we have uh, people from the school, from our nonprofit sector, uh, local uh, elected officials, and the list goes on and on. Parents uh, of children, prevention coalitions, and things like that. And 
when this information is received, we send it on to them. This committee, this coalition has agreed that when this happens and if it meets this criteria, that they automatically will approve this message to go out to the community. Now, that's when that press release is therefore issued by the Reno Recovery Collaborative. Now, this is something we put a lot of thought into, right? The health department could release that press release. And in a sense, it is through the health department, but we always put on there that it's coming from the Reno Recovery Collaborative to show that this is coming from a multiple, um, a multi-sector partnership in the community. And the reason that that's so important is it shows that it's not just coming from the health department. It's not just coming from law enforcement. It's coming from the whole collaborative. Thank you, DJ, for getting getting that pulled up. And here, uh, this is this is an example of one of those. And it's allowed us to uh, give some education uh, to our community because everyone can uh, see that dashboard that DJ's made up and uh, get a load of that information, but they deserve the information that we're getting. And this is a way that we can be transparent with our community. Very good question. So uh, for Molly, I'm gonna just go ahead and answer that real quick. So as we talked about earlier, EMS and the county coroner were onboarded into this uh, system. So they enter in the data of overdoses and whether they are non-fatal, fatal, the suspected substance, and if there was naloxone administered. So what, what this has also uh, done for us is it's allowed us to, um, based on the substance, give substance education in those press releases, encourage community to naloxone trainings. Uh, if you notice on that press release, we did have DECA's information and overall awareness of substances. This is also where we partner up with our other uh, organizations within the community to offer that education. Um, typically, when we think of overdoses, um, right now, of course, we think opioids. But as has been brought out in this conference and in the data that we've been uh, collecting, we're seeing more stimulant overdose. And so that allows us to uh, Taylor make our messages uh, to the community too, to educate them on the differences and what to look for. And of course, services available as well. Um, in, that, in that framework too, that's when we increase or encourage the, our law enforcement EMS to have extra, of course, naloxone. Uh, once again, I'll, DJ, you already know what's coming. I'll thank DECA for their uh, support with uh, providing Reno County with um, naloxone. So as you see in this one, um, this is some of the attention that it's gotten, right? Um, not that we're out there trying to seek that, but when we, when we institute a new program and when we start getting the data to support what the community was saying all along, this is a huge thing. And so that's why we want to uh, we wanted to convey that in these press releases. You'll see in some of the other. Uh, if you want to go to that uh, middle one, yeah. If you see in this one, uh, it's been able. This has afforded us an opportunity to get out there and educate the public on the naloxone because of. Uh, the overdoses. It's also been one of those things to where we've been able to change our approach a little bit. We sat down as a collaborative and we did, we went back and forth a little bit with some of our partners and we're like, well, you know, why isn't the message don't do drugs? And this is where the collaborative, we were able to come to a, an understanding that the majority of the people that were obviously losing to overdose are people that are already using substances. So if you want to back out of there, um, DJ, um, what we've, and go to one of the press releases, <clears throat> one of the things that we've encouraged people to do, like we said in that framework, is get the education and the training of naloxone, uh, encourage more people to carry naloxone, 
encourage members of the community who use substances to not use alone. And then of course, to check in on friends and family regularly that use substances. Now, this has been a little bit of a different response, but what we're trying to do is make sure that, that people are understanding that we notice the issue, that we're willing to be transparent about the issue, and that we're concerned about members of our community. In the most modern uh, press release too that we don't have a picture of, we also list our, uh, all of our treatment resources, another uh, program that we have going on here in Reno County called the Recovery Response Team and things like that. And what that's actually allowed us to do through those press releases is in this last month, our partner um, with that Recovery Response Team told me that in October, of this last month, their calls to uh, uh, people calling the, the program have been up 80% of people looking for, for resources. And that means those people got referred to services. So that's one way that we're able to use this data that we're getting. Um, DJ, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you for the dashboard discussion. Yeah, so one thing that we like to do is communicate data with the public in near real time. This dashboard here gets updated probably about once a week. We update it more often during the spike alerts. Um, it's available for the public, but our general audience for this dashboard is certainly the media and all of our community partners that uh, specifically work with substance misuse so that they're always aware of what's happening in the community. And we can also learn a few things. So uh, in Reno County, our official overdose fatality numbers year by year averages around eight, but between October of 2020 and September, 2021, we tracked 19 fatalities in OD map or 78 of those events of the 359 overdoses since for 13 months uh, also required some use of Narcan. And then the trends changed quite a bit too from the beginning of the year and on. So we'll just go over October through January 1st. We had about 20% of our suspected overdoses were heroin, 19% alcohol, and nearly 12% were methamphetamines. But if we look at more recently, we go to July and through today, the trends are quite a bit different. So 28% of our suspected overdose are methamphetamine, 13% heroin, and 18% alcohol. So methamphetamine over the last few months has been our most common overdose. And you can see that here too on this map here, where we've had over the last three months quite the spike in methamphetamine overdoses. Um, that's part of the reason why we've had to release a couple of spike alerts for methamphetamine increases there. Uh, we also like to give credit to the EMS, Fran County Health Department and Coroner, all for getting involved in, in Hutchinson Regional Medical Center for providing the syndromic data, which is here. And this is part of that supplemental data that we use to determine whether or not spikes are actually happening in the community. And the other way that we used it is by tracking infectious diseases. So I know we're not the only county that had a hepatitis A outbreak uh, this year, there were several others. And we learned pretty early on that our hepatitis outbreak was not foodborne, that it was among people who use substances. But we didn't have more than I think six cases at the time and we were bringing in a mobile vaccination clinic from KDHE to help us vaccinate at-risk people for hep A. So we used ODMAP to determine where that hepatitis A vaccination clinic was going to be placed. And so when you look at the, the hep A outbreaks over now, so when, now when we look at the data here, this is census tracts, these black lines, the borders, the bigger these pink purple dots are, the more hep A cases we had, and the heat map is the overdoses. So we can see that our overall substance use trends also match our hepatitis A trends as far as where our positives were for hep A. And there is a pretty specific and clear relationship. And we were constantly mapping our hep A outbreak to see how close in proximity these hep A cases were to 
some of the same drugs that they were listing uh, as their risk. And there are times where it's really, you can tell within a few blocks of a lot where these overdoses are, or even on top of where the overdoses are. Also, if you're curious about how far you can zoom into OD map to see where the overdose is, this is about how far you can zoom in. And so that's, that's typically one of the HIPAA concerns is that uh, you can just zoom in all the way and find out where a person lives. If you put a satellite image on here and look at the dot, you, you can't tell uh, where that overdose is. It's mostly a general location of where they're at. And so the other thing that we do, we look at OD map. We can use this heat map, for instance, of where the drug overdoses are. Now we can look at, well, what are the characteristics of those neighborhoods? Uh, so we start looking at social determinants of health. Uh, we do a lot of stuff with employers. So we can look at how many employees in a certain type of industry also live in the area. And here we have an infographic. So we're gonna look at our census tract six in Reno County here. And we can see that median age 31.9 for some counties, maybe like Johnson County. This, is, this doesn't appear young to you, uh, but this is young for Reno County where the median age is a lot older. 20% of our population is above the age of 65. But you can see in this that our disbursement in age groups here is much younger than the general Reno County population. Our, large, our largest group in this area are males between 25 and 29, although we do have a lot of 30 year olds too. And then we do have a pretty high percentage of children, once again, compared to the rest of Reno County where you know, nearly 15, 16% of the female population is under the age of 10. And so we can use this data to see, you know, potentially how many children are at risk uh, of being around substances, of falling into neighborhood or familiar pre familial pressures. Uh, we can also look at some of the education data. Um, so here, you know, we have compared to the rest of Reno County, we have a lot more people that never finished ninth grade or never made it to ninth grade. Uh, we have a lot more people that have no diploma and generally just a lot lower education rates. We have more poverty, median household income. We have our income disbursements here so we can learn a lot more about the neighborhood. But one of the more important things that we can do, uh, we do a lot of education with employers, as I mentioned. We can look at where uh, this population works. So we know that far above average, this population, nearly one in five workers work either in transportation or moving. And so one way we can use this data is by finding the transportation and moving companies, which um, the census does provide this information uh, is through the NAICS or S SIC. And it's on the census webpage, but I use a different program just for ease. Um, and so we we're able to find certain employers, their names, where they're located and how many employees they have so that we can really talk to the industries that have a lot of employees first, make sure that we get education out to them. And it's just really important overall for our strategic sense. And let me move over to our other high intensity census track here. So a little bit different, the life expectancy rate's about five years higher. Uh, in Kansas, the life expectancy rate is around 78. The other census tract was at 70, so one of the lowest life expectancy rates in the entire state. Uh, probably the overdoses play a part in that. Uh, here, once again, a younger population compared to the rest of Reno County. High disbursement of children, 15% under the age of 10 in both age groups. Uh, less above the age 65 population, males 30 to 34 most popular in this area. And then the employment is different. So we have a lot more production workers, above average construction, above average food preparation in comparison to the rest of Reno County. So once again, we can use this information to find certain employers to provide that education to or discuss policy initiatives and other ways that they can make informed decisions or changes that benefit their employees' lives. And next, Seth will talk about harm reduction. Awesome. So <clears throat> some of the things that we, when we think about, we've heard harm reduction several times on this conference um, today. So harm reduction is just the practical, a set of practical ideas and strategies that are aimed at reducing the negative effects of uh, various human behaviors. So 
What OD map does is it allows us to get smart and have data to back up and give us specifics of where we need to focus these efforts. Some of the things we already talked about, I kind of got ahead of myself on the press release about adapting our community messaging. The reason that um, I, I get excited about that is because it's important in the sense of we are communities, right? Um, we are communities going through hard times when we talk about these types of issues. Um, these are those adaptive challenges that, that we have. This gives us a chance to make people that, as DJ said from his last, um, his last section that he talked about, these are people that are coming from harder uh, backgrounds, right? These are people that have been going through other things that now have substance use disorder as part of their life. And when we as communities show that we're using some of this information to give credit to their story and that we're caring about them and trying to do something about it, it means something on that personal, personal level. Plus, it's good for us as communities to be able to uh, focus those efforts and also to have the data to support why we're doing so. This also lets us focus our naloxone distributions uh, with partner agencies and uh, where we also uh, flood the, the neighborhoods with resources on how to get naloxone. This also affords us the opportunity to give substance specific education. This has allowed us to partner up with other agencies, for instance, like uh, Rise Up Reno, uh, a youth prevention coalition. And uh, they, they were able to take a lot of the information uh, that we were uh, providing with ODMAP and they came up with a great uh, fentanyl pressed pill um, uh, slideshow that they passed out to their, or that they presented to the children there at the high school and middle school. And that's a huge piece too. Now also, one of the biggest things that we can utilize this for is stigma reduction. It's, it's interesting to note that um, in early, earlier on with some of the data that we were seeing was while we had more overdoses in a, in a part of the community that was a, a lower socioeconomic status, uh, we had more overdoses there, but we had more fatalities in the more affluent uh, area of town. And it's not necessarily proven, but um, we can only uh, assume that part of that could be stigma. Why? Well, we know that ones in that more affluent part of town might be less likely to go and pick up naloxone or might be less likely to seek out help or utilize the resources that we're putting out there in the press releases. And not to mention, those are probably ones that have a, a higher chance of using a loan to try to hide it from their coworkers or even their families. So these are ways that we can utilize the data that we're collecting uh, in this uh, program to implement harm reduction strategies. And this is, just, this is just one area. The thing that's so neat about this is it gives us the opportunity to get creative. With that creativity, we're gonna go on to this next section about that future of OD map. And I, I really like the quote that, that DJ uh, put on here. Most of the world will make decisions by either guessing or using their gut. They'll either be lucky or wrong. It's a pretty interesting quote, and I'm sure DJ is going to expound on that here in a little bit. I can see him laughing about it. So the the thing is, is this we want we have a we have this vision, right? We can see it. We can see how useful this program is. But along with how useful it is, is a call to action. This is where we need more counties onboarded with this program to 
to track these patterns. It's like uh, DJ was saying earlier, a lot of times we'll watch things in Oklahoma just creep closer and closer to us. Um, every day or two, it gets closer and closer. And then there's just this drop off at the Kansas state line. And then two days later, we're getting told that we're having three or four or five overdoses within a 24 hour period. This emphasizes the need for uh, partnerships and not just community partnerships. In this case, we need the state to be on board with this. We need more people to be on board with this to give us at least an idea of what we're seeing. It's like Dr. Anda said in the uh, Kaiser Permanente study when they were doing the ACEs, the Adverse Childhood Experiences study. Um, he said, what's predictable is preventable. And so the same is true with this. If we can see these things coming closer to us, it'll allow us to adapt our strategies based off of the trends that we're seeing. So the same is true. We need our neighboring states on board to monitor spike alerts um, in neighboring states so that we can be prepared before bad batches of uh, substances or, or just potency, substances with extreme potency too. And that's the, that's the thing. See, there's, there's only so much we can do from this end. But with what we can do at this end, it's important for us to do all that we can. It only makes sense. One of DJ's quotes that I will, I'm gonna steal it, bro. But he says, sharing data saves lives. And that's so true. Imagine if we had EMS, imagine if we had law enforcement, if, imagine if we had all these different organizations, these first responders, they were all entering in this data, entering in these suspected substances. Imagine how much more of a clearer picture it would paint. Imagine those heat maps. I mean, look what DJ could do with those heat maps and how he could tie in so many different things. This is where we need buy-in. When we talk about all those partnerships, we need buy-in from all local stakeholders so that we can share that information and pool those resources. So that being said, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, Reno County and some of the things that we've seen. Um, we have our EMS, we have uh, our uh, county coroner. We still have been working, and, and I have to give some, some people who are on the call have even uh, been big, big in, in helping us try to get more uh, partnerships uh, from Reno County to, to join forces. Particularly, um, it would be great if some of our law enforcement could buy in um, on, a, on a more committed level we hear from ones within our community that there are a lot of overdoses that are happening that still are not being reported. And um, unfortunately, that just increases the chance of us missing something. That increases the chance of us not hearing about the fact that this individual's um, the main suspected drug was uh, methamphetamine, but they also had a suspicion of fentanyl. What, that, that right there, it might seem like a conundrum and it is, but we need that kind of information so that we can be aware of what is out there and what's affecting our population. And so we can give them a warning and we can let them know and so that we can educate ourselves on it. And so we can reach out to the other states that have been seeing this for a lot longer than us. The data that we collect leads to prevention. It can lead to treatment. How so, you might ask? Well, let's put it to you like this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through a little bit of history lesson real quick. So, like I said, we have, <laughs> like I said, we have that uh, that collaborative here in Reno County, right? 
when this that thing started back in 2015, they realized that they needed to do something different in Reno County. They realized that we had people that were dying and that people were experiencing overdoses and there wasn't certain types of help for them. And they got together and they said, here's the kind of help we need. We need an inpatient treatment facility. We need medically assisted treatment. We need more Narcan. We need it more available. We need crisis response to deal with people in mental health, having mental health and substance use crisis. We need recovery response teams. We need all these things. When they got together and they said that, we had people like DJ who were able to go around and collect the data to support that we needed those things. The data that we're collecting now with ODMAP, we're using it primarily for messaging, but it's also the information that we'll be able to utilize to get grants, to further our work, and to no doubt promote our next levels of treatment that we need. So speaking of those things that I just mentioned, back in 2015 when that was first started, uh, I just, I just want to say that Reno County has done an outstanding job because we now have an inpatient treatment facility. We, we, we need other things, yeah, but we're meeting these goals. We have a detox facility for people who are in crisis. We have the crisis response team with HPD that is allowing people in crisis to, instead of going to jail and getting new charges, to try a diversionary approach. That way, these ones are not experiencing the barriers put upon them in the legal system. We have two providers providing MAT, medically assisted treatment. See, those are the wins that come from collecting data. And most importantly, from sharing data with one another and bringing together various partnerships within the community. People need to be there. People need to have their voice heard. That means people in recovery. That means people in the treatment industry. That means our healthcare community. That means law enforcement for sure. That means our EMS, public health departments, and the list goes on and on and on. ODMAP is a huge tool and an intersect right now. We've even had people in other harm reduction coalitions that have reached out to us asking how we're using ODMAP in conjunction as a harm reduction tool. So it's pretty interesting what we're able to do. Um, I'm gonna turn it back over to DJ because I'm sure he's got something to say real quick. Yeah, so just real quick, I wanna also show how easy ODMAP is to use. Um, so once you get involved, it's, there's not a lot of training required. It's pretty simple. Um, there are two different ways you can go about it. You can have one designated person enter in all the information. You can also, if you're a law enforcement agency, you get every single officer and account, have them enter it in themselves as it occurs. Either one works in Reno County, uh, EMS has one person enter in the overdose uh, data every morning, and, and so he's the only one with an account. It's none of the EMTs. Uh, nationally, Seth and I have had conversations, and most counties have better luck getting law enforcement on board. Uh, we're kind of the opposite in Reno County. We were able to get EMS coroner on board, and uh, we're struggling with law enforcement. Uh, but if you go through the roster, Law enforcement is probably the number one user nationwide uh, of ODMAP, which public health should be playing a role in this. The data is valuable to public health departments and public health agencies. So even when we're not entering data in, we can still learn a lot. So you can enter in overdoses with these. Uh, there is some information on here that might freak some of you out, but it's not viewable. So one, you have to enter in an address. That's how we get the plot points. I can't view the address. So once CMS enters, enters that data in, gets de-identified, I don't know the address of the person. All of this information here, age, gender, if the person was taken to the hospital, I can't view any of that. 
EMS enters it in, uh, it gets aggregated to uh, HIDA so that they can use it for research, but not viewable. So once again, de-identified when it runs through, it allows HIDA to use this information for research that they publish fairly often. Uh, the information that you can view is this here, the primary suspected drug, additional suspected drug, um, and it's really easy. You would just select it, and if it was a non-fatal overdose, you select whether or not naloxone was administered, or if you don't know if naloxone was administered. We can see that on our end. We can see um, if it was multiple doses, no dose, a single dose, or whether they didn't know. And the same thing goes for the fatalities. We can see whether or not naloxone was used in those fatalities. So the information that we can see on our end is pretty basic. It, there's, we can't stratify by age. We can't stratify by gender. We don't know if men or women uh, overdose more often in Reno County. We can only go off of the studies that we see or read uh, based on the substance trends. So really easy tool, um, really easy to get started. You go to odmap.org and you sign up. There's a sign up sheet on the website. You go through, you select the person you want to be in charge of your agency and they send you an email and get you connected. There's training so resources on uh, YouTube. There's training resource PDFs on their website. So really simple, really easy to use. So I guess with the remaining time, I think we could probably answer some questions. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing here. So real quick, I was just going to say that um, there was a there was a couple questions on here. Um, so um, so there was one uh, DJ. I don't know if you're looking at it too. Um, if you've already talked about it, but has OD map been used in conjunction with medical examiners or other similar parties to track suicides? Not that I know of. Yeah, like so, OD map has like a submission thing where you can submit ideas, and I've submitted you know some stuff about um, you know allowing us to view whether or not the overdoses were attempted suicide or accidental overdose, because I, I think those are key data points that would be good for us to know on the county end. The only way that I can view it is through Essence using the syndromic surveillance data. Um, I think Greg Crawford from uh, OBS uh, put that, uh, that they can provide anyone interested um, in Essence data. So it looks like Greg Cropper could probably uh, fulfill those data requests if you wanted to know how many ED visits for overdoses your county's getting. Um, there, there are some counties, like I said, that maybe their hospital system isn't connected to Essence. So, you know, don't be surprised if you get data back where you only had one overdose ED visit for the entire year and it was because they went to a hospital in Kansas City or Wichita. Um, so there's the downside to that. Um, but we are able to see whether or not someone attempted suicide and overdose through essence. Thank you, DJ. So I, so we have another one here, another question and comment um, about stigma reduction. I'm asking if there's anything we can do to educate the community that addiction isn't a choice and it's a disease. And then this is a kind of goes along with this other one. Is there a way that the program would track mental illness or previous health conditions that might have aided an individual in becoming an addict. Um, to the first part of the uh, question, uh, Stacy, definitely stigma reduction, there's always more that we can do. Um, and for instance, uh, it wasn't too long ago in Reno County, we put on those community conversations that we held at the Fox Theater. Um, it was a three month long uh, series where we brought in uh, treatment providers. We even had a judge of drug courts. We had some law enforcement partners that all got up and we all talked about stigma and what we can do about it and the three types of stigma. And I feel like those things are very important. And um, especially uh, as, as people with lived experience, um, that's, that's our jobs per se to make sure that our voices are heard. Um, that, I, I guess I didn't say that. I mean, I'm a person in long-term recovery and what that looks like for me is I haven't used a substance since July 23rd of 2017. 
And when we get up here in these type of settings and we say that and have an active part in the, the solution, it helps in that stigma reduction in itself. So Stacy, I agree. And I would encourage you to get a hold of us to be a part of some of that stigma reduction. Yeah, and on the second half of that, whether or not we can track, you know, some of the underlying conditions or mental health illnesses, uh, we're unable to track for the specific individual, but we can look at that census tract map overlaid with the heat map, determine which census tracts have the most overdoses, and then we can look at some of the underlying medical conditions that are overall part of that census tract. So, and I, I didn't have it on the infographic, so I apologize for that, but we have looked at it. And typically, and this is more true for any census tract that has high poverty rates, you generally see a lot more obesity. You see a lot more people reporting more than 14 poor mental health days. You see a lot more high blood pressure. It, it's just far above average um, in census tracts with high poverty. And so we are able to view those things. Uh, that data you can usually get from also, you can also get it from KDHE, the purpose data. Um, but CDC Places uh, has that data as well. And I think the CDC Places webpage already has the maps available. So you could zoom in and that data is easily usable because it's free. So something too, I wanted to uh, touch on real quick. Um, it, Todd and then another person private messaged me a question too. Um, Todd said, in, in our opinion, what are the biggest barriers in Kansas to cities and counties using ODMAP? Well, one of the barriers I feel like people have the concern of time um, and a fear of the unknown. And I think that, I think if they just sat down with DJ and I, they would have all their uh, fears uh, totally taken care of. That's what I'd like to think anyway. But um, I think that that's a lot of it is a misunderstanding of how long it takes to uh, put in this data. But then the biggest one that we've seen and we've touched on it before is the privacy issues. I think a lot of times we overcomplicate. Um, we overcomplicate things. And for some reason, it's easier for us as humans to just say, oh, yeah, it probably won't work than to actually look into what will make it work and to get the specifics of it. Uh, DJ, any thoughts on that as well? No, I think that's exactly right. I, I think one reason why counties are having a much easier time getting law enforcement involved in OD map is that there's no HIPAA concerns there um, with law enforcement agencies. And so we're really struggling to get health department, EMS involved because there are those concerns. And I, I agree with Seth. There are times where, you know, we, we think too many things are unshareable. Um, when HIPAA does provide us you know, some leeway with data sharing agreements, some information that can be shared, de-identified information that can be shared. Geospatial is relatively new to the public health realm though, and that freaks a lot of people out. And where I specialize in is geospatial analysis. And so it's a part of my everyday life to make sure that we can visually look at things and really, and really target where we're putting our resources. But it also is complicated, I'm not going to lie, it's, it is complicated to make sure you're HIPAA compliant with geospatial technology. But ODMAP has gone through everything they could. They've talked to attorneys. The uh, Bureau of Justice has a whole presentation on why it's HIPAA compliant. CDC has endorsed the use of ODMAP, uh, particularly because of the relationships it can build between public safety and public health. Um, so if we can get over those barriers, if, if we can just stop being scared and, you know, really start collecting the information, I, I think there's always something that will surprise you in the data. And even if there's not, at least you can tell the migratory patterns of those drug, the drug spikes that are coming your way, and you'll be able to be prepared in time. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for letting us uh, present this. This is definitely something that I, we're learning on. We're learning still. And so if any of, of your uh, partners in uh, your areas uh, would like to visit about it, man, we would, we would love to because this will benefit all of us. This is one of those things that, yes, we're in Reno County, 
But this is something that if we as a state got on board with the possibilities of prevention and innovative approaches to these uh, strategies that we need to combat this crisis would be absolutely, they're just, they're just, the possibilities are endless. Thanks, Seth. Thanks, TJ. Hey, would you mind putting your um, your email then in the in the chat, Seth? I think that would be a great way for connection. Any other questions? You can reach out to Seth and DJ. I'm sure they would be happy to continue the conversation and connection even long after uh, our session here today. Thank you all for joining. Our time today has now come to a close. We have one more session to attend today. So uh, don't go far, hop off of this um, Zoom and go into our very last session together. It will start at 3.30. Um, so grab another drink and settle in and be ready for the last session at 3.30. Um, thanks again, DJ and Seth. We appreciate all of your words of wisdom. It was a very great and informative session today. So thank you, thank you. Um, and with that, we will see you all in the next and last session. Have a great afternoon.